Uh, we are meeting today to talk about hiatal hernias. Woo! So um, I want to present something to you, um, the viewer here, who wants to learn a little bit about our bodies, right? Hiatal hernias happen in our tummies. Um, a lot of people are starting to learn about this. Uh, today I want to present two things. I want to educate you and I want to present to you a patient, a real life patient that I treated in office in 2016. Um, I should actually write the paper and submit it, um, but you know, when life gets busy, you just kind of overlook that. Anyways, I am Dr. Nicole Clercy Moore and I am going to jump in here. Um, yeah, so Basically, a lot of times um, people might think hiatal hernia, oh my gosh, I've seen my MD, I have to get surgery, um, there's more education coming out, which is amazing, um, but there isn't always surgery required, and the majority of times surgery is not required. So anyways, my office, I work um, and own and operate a clinic, um, it's called Perfect Touch Massage and Chiropractic. I am located currently in Bonita Springs, Florida, Southwest Florida here, and that's physical location. So if you need to come see me, you know where I'm at. If you are in the state of Minnesota, I do have a virtual clinic there as well, and I'm licensed and certified and um, able to see you via telemedicine. Anyways, to get into my background, because you know everybody loves to hear about this, why am I telling you all this stuff? Am I qualified? Yes, so I am a chiropractor by trade. I went to school for a very long time and became a chiropractor back in 2015. I also um, took 300 hours in um, chiropractic neurology training. I can sit for my boards. Um, that one's a little scary for me and my Life doesn't indicate that right now. I also got certified back in 2019 in functional medicine, um, and I'm also a massage therapist by trade. So I am qualified to teach about hiatal hernias and also treatment um, of them. Uh, today I'm going to jump in. I broke it into two parts, and for those of you who are not interested in the case report and all the mumbo jumbo about specifics on the patient. Um, I want you to listen to the first half. That's going to be the education of what our body is, what our body does when we are to be normal, but also to have um, things happen to us. And in this case, it's going to be hiatal hernias and what that is. So if you want to skip ahead and you already know what a hiatal hernia is, um, after this next slide, you can I think what I'm going to do after I post this is I will put the time on there for part two um, and that will be where I begin the case report. So hang on to your seats, get your pen and paper out um, or take some pictures if you're watching this YouTube video online. Don't forget to subscribe, to share and to send. It really, really helps um, get this information out there to other people. So I just wanted to start with this. The medical doctor wanted to do surgery. When my patient called me from the MD's office and asked me if there's anything I can do for her hernia, oh, I was so excited. So she came in that afternoon, I adjusted her. She had at home stuff to do and confirmation came in that her hernia was gone, right? If she wouldn't have done that, her outcome would have been very different. I want to speak on this a little bit. Um, you are your best advocate. I have a few, um, I have a few YouTubes on this. I want to actually post my book here soon. I have a book written on uh, different things that we look at and how we can be our best advocate and how we can choose the right doctor for what we need instead of being frustrated all the time. But MD, who was um, identifying her hiatal hernia was very surprised that she was choosing not to do surgery. She came in and she decided to come get adjusted. Um, and when she went back in, her MD was flabbergasted, right? So her MD was like, well, 
okay, well, this is going to come back and this and this. And she's like, well, I'm pain free and this is what's happening. So her MD kind of learned a little bit like there's other possibilities. This is possible. Um, her case adjuster, because this was a work comp claim, her case adjuster was very happy to avoid paying for six weeks out of work, plus the surgery. I think I calculated it was somewhere between like thirty and sixty thousand dollars because you know work comp, you're out of work, you got to pay all these things, um, plus the surgery, uh, yada yada, all this stuff combined. Um, but what really gets me to the place of educating people right now, what I'm doing today, is that my patient got the best care that she could. She got pain relief, she got answers, her hernia was gone, and she didn't get care that she didn't need or that she didn't want. It aligned with what she thought would it be, you know, like her, her directive of her health was sustained, right? So she was able to get into life the way she wanted. That is the most important thing that I want to say 95% of all doctors desire. Um, so let's get into what is a hiatal hernia. So this is the why I'm educating today. This is why I do what I do because patients don't always know how to advocate for themselves or can't advocate for themselves properly. I know a lot about the system and I've been screwed over a lot by the system. I've learned how to take hold and be accountable for my choices in health. Um, so I just want to share that with people so you don't have to um, feel taken advantage of, that you have the best tools and resources that you have. All right, so education, hiatal hernia. A hernia basically is something that pushes through the barrier of something else and where it shouldn't be, right? So I just took a common definition here. You can read it. You don't really need to have me read it to you. You are fully capable. There's the website if you need to just kind of look through a lot more information. You can Google it. You can duck, duck, go it. You can whatever, search it. Um, but there's a picture up there. It's basically our diaphragm and keeping our organ systems above or below them appropriately is the challenge, right? So somebody who is healthy, somebody who is mobile, our stomach stays below that diaphragm. Um, our esophagus has a little hole um, created, you know, in between that diaphragm. The diaphragm is a muscle. And so when the diaphragm is working properly, right, we're breathing, we're moving, we're doing what we need to do, our esophagus fits, our stomach doesn't push through, right? So there's a lot of different things that can happen to create the stomach to out pocket and go up through. Um, but normally our diaphragm is keeping our stomach and all the other organs below it the way it should, right? Um, our muscles tend to do that, right? We have Oh, I should put on here um, a different picture. Anyways, we have our diaphragm that sits above our organs, our internal, like our intestines, our stomach, um, pancreas, liver, gallbladder, all of those organs. Um, and then we have our pelvic floor that goes, basically it's our undercarriage, right? And then we have our core muscles that conclude more of what we think of is our abdomen, our obliques, our rectus abdominis, and then we have our posterior muscles by our spine, right? So then we have our quad, um, what is it? Our QL muscle, our multifidi, all of those that kind of support and house our organs around the ribs, that soft tissue point between our hips, hip bones and our rib cage. The diaphragm is oftentimes overlooked diaphragmatic breathing, exercises. Um, we often send people home to do just to make sure that their back is feeling better, um, that digestion gets better. Our diaphragm is an extremely important muscle. Now above the diaphragm is our heart, you know, uh, our esophagus, we have our lungs, we have a lot of um, 
our arteries up there. Our arteries go posteriorly behind that. Anyways, you don't need a history um, lesson in our <laughs> anatomy. So the diaphragm is a very extremely important muscle. We need to keep our stomach down below it. A hiatal hernia basically is where that stomach pushes up above it and there's reasons for that. But it is very common. As you can see here statistically, 20% of all people in the United States will experience this once or more in their lifetime. And a lot of times those people who get one hiatal hernia get it more, right? So they get it more often. And the reason is because they don't do anything to strengthen the diaphragm, to stretch the diaphragm, to um, correct their seating, sitting positions, they're standing, they're sleeping. Um, they continue on with their life because, well, you correct the hiatal hernia once and they keep doing what they're doing, right? So you just have patients who do that. Um, the statistic that follows this is 50% of the 20% is over the age of 50. So we look at as we age, our muscles don't get used properly. Um, so they get weaker or they get overused and we get problems like a hiatal hernia. Now, just like anything else, there's different types. There's a scale, right? The most common is the sliding hernia. Now, what you're going to see there is it's just kind of um, our diaphragm gets a little weaker, our stomach, just a portion of it kind of goes above it and gets stuck, right? So let's say you have GERD or acid reflux, right? So you're just laying down at night and you're like, oh, this just hasn't gone away. Well, that's a possibility you have more of a sliding hiatal hernia. Um, the other three that we're going to talk about here you can read is a paraesophageal uh, type. And basically what that means is you're going to have um, you're going to have an out pocketing. You're going to have more of the stomach and or other organs pushing up through that diaphragm. Our diaphragm can get extremely weak. Um, when, when our diaphragm gets extremely weak, whether we're deficient in something or we're not using it or, you know, um, I don't know, say we lay down and we just don't move, we're overweight, um, you have a standard American diet and you're missing magnesium. There's a whole lot of things that can cause our diaphragm to get weak. Um, when we look at the upper part of the stomach coming through, right, so we're going to have a greater weakness of the diaphragm, but also we're going to have, sometimes you get like a trauma, right? So you get a car accident, like in, in this um, case study I'm going to talk about, that was probably um, the moment where she got a hiatal hernia. And what happens is when you get a jolting, let's say you go on a ride at Disney World or you jump on a trampoline and you just are a full jolt, right? Or you get in a car accident, you get that trauma that happens and that can push it through. Um, then you go into type three, it's combination of one and two, meaning Sometimes it's going to be a full um, stomach herniation or a rolling type herniation. And sometimes it's just going to come out and it's going to bounce between the two because, you know, why not have one and two um, put together because that's the most fun. And the fourth one, this one is extremely rare. A lot of times they won't even talk about it. We're not going to get into it. This is like 0.1%, maybe 0.2% of all the hernias um, for our stomach. Um, and so this is where basically not only does your stomach come through, but maybe your pancreas, right? Or something else gets trapped in there. This is a major thing. And this is where we'll talk about possibly um, going into a surgery type situation. So 95% are the type one treatable and pre preventable at home. And also if you're having issues with it or need education on it, go to your chiropractor. Do you have a hiatal hernia? So the only way you can truly diagnose a hiatal hernia is with imaging. You don't have to get imaging. I don't recommend getting imaging. Um, typically you find a hiatal hernia 
because of a case study that I'm going to present here at the end is they have something else going on. They came in for a motor vehicle accident. Um, their shoulder was not getting better. And so they had a history of cancer in their family. And I wanted to make sure to rule that out so that we didn't leave the patient with, um, with issues going forward, correct? So think about if you have heartburn or indigestion or you're burping a lot after you eat or um, you have difficulty swallowing, you wake up in the morning and all day long you're like, wow, why is my throat sound so crappy and it's scratchy and it's not flu season and nobody in your house is sick, right? So these are some of the most common symptoms that you just kind of brush off and maybe they come, maybe they go, but it's something to look at if it's recurrent and becomes bothersome. All right, so this one is a cool animated slide thing that I found. Um, basically, when you are at home and you think that maybe I have a hiatal hernia, this is something that you can do. So I want you to take a snapshot of this or pause it or whatever you need to do to kind of get the gist of it, write it down. Um, basically, this is your first stop. If you think, oh my gosh, I have GERD, I've had GERD forever, um, I might have a hiatal hernia that's just never gotten resolved. What you do is you just leave a glass of water by your bed right when you wake up in the morning. You drink it. It should be warm or room temperature. Then you can look like this guy, right? So you put your arms up and you breathe in. And then you go up on your toes and you drop down. It's going to be a big bamming sound. The purpose of that is to get your diaphragm in a position to allow the water to pull the stomach out of the diaphragm, right? Throw your arms up, take a few short, quick breaths. That's going to contract and tighten the diaphragm to help the hole that the esophagus goes through not be as large, right? So what happens if you do this and you don't have a hiatal hernia? nothing, right? Well, your spouse or your dog or whoever is going to think you're stupid, right? You look stupid. <laughs> but if you do have a hiatal hernia, it's type 1, it's 95% of the time, guess what? Maybe by doing this for two weeks, for a week, you completely fix your hiatal hernia, your acid reflux goes away, you start actually using the stomach the way it should, your diaphragm relaxes, then it gets stronger. Um, I would look at doing different exercises after you do treat and we'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, so when you're done doing that, right, and say it helps and you're like, wow, I feel great, I can eat, I don't have acid reflux anymore, um, I would continue doing some of these other things that will help you keep it gone, right? So I would massage your stomach. Your abdomen does have muscles in there. I would maybe get on a foam roller, go get a massage. Um, look up some YouTube videos on how to massage the diaphragm. Exercise. Go for a walk every day. If you're, um, if you're not active and you sit at a desk every day, going for a walk every day or stretching every day is considered exercise. So go do that. If you need to lose weight, that is an important pressure that you can let off of our diaphragm. When we lose that weight, we also lose all of the internal fat that presses up against the diaphragm and makes that diaphragm more weak. So if you want to lose weight and you've tried everything, I just released a video on the four pillars of health. Go watch it. Um, it will blow your mind and give you things to do to help your foundation before you try dieting again because diets only work if your foundation doesn't have any issues. Um, stretching. Stretching is a really great thing. You can do specific stretching to really help open up your core, um, right? So if we talk about our core, we're looking at abdominal muscles, pelvic floor, diaphragm, and our back. So any stretching in those facets is going to be helpful then you have to go and watch and correct your posture. When you're seated, there's a way to sit. When you're laying, there's a way to lay. You need to look at your posture. 
If your low back curvature is going the wrong way because you're relaxed in your chair all day long, that closes on your diaphragm. When that closes on your diaphragm and your chest cavity, guess what happens? It puts more pressure and pushes your stomach up further. You need to open up the rib cage. I have a whole video on that as well. Seek it out on my YouTube channel. Um, when do you see a chiropractor for this? Okay, so let's say you did that really cool exercise every morning for two weeks and you're not getting relief. If you've been to see your medical doctor and for GERD and it's been chronic and your um, blue pill's not working, right? And they go, well, let's image it. Maybe you got something stuck in there. Um, if you do that and they're like, you have a hiatal hernia, get your image or don't get your image and go to your chiropractor. Um, if you're on heartburn medication and you want to get off of it, guess what? There's ways to reestablish a good, healthy acidity for your stomach and to see if there's anything else to fix if you have a hiatal hernia um, at a chiropractic office. Just make sure to ask your chiropractor when you see them again. All right, when to get surgery? Never. I'm just kidding. Um, Typically, it's going to be, like I said, that 0.1, 0.2% of the 20% of people who get this, right? Surgery is for those who are unwilling to um, address the situation. They are older or they have some kind of disease pattern that makes their muscles lose um, elasticity or strength. Um, maybe they have a severe trauma and they get into a motorcycle accident. Those are going to be the times when you do that. Um, a hiatal hernia repair is what they call it. And basically, there's different ways to do it. I, I, if you want to look it up, I would recommend it would be an interesting Google for you. Um, but if you've done home care, you've worked with your chiropractor, you've done your diaphragm exercises, you've done everything, and nothing is working, and your image says okay, you do have a type three or type four, then obviously this is the time that you should consider other options, which is surgery. Okay, so for those of you who have learned what you wanna learn, sayonara, like our page, subscribe, come back, I don't know, give me some feedback on what um, I should do next for education. For those of you who are like me and you want to know the nitty gritty, we're just going to get into all the boring stuff. So we're going to go through who my patient is and all of that good stuff. Okay, so just a fair warning. Okay, so my patient came in um, on the 18th of January 2016. The injury happened five days prior. She was in a motor vehicle accident. She was rear-ended. Um, basically hit the airbag, was looking up at her mirror, and has a severe pain in her neck, okay? Um, basically, when she came in, we didn't adjust her neck because in every single motion, it was strict pain right at her SP on her seventh vertebra. I thought maybe it's chipped. I don't know, with such severe whiplash, maybe a muscle pulled part of that off. I didn't know exactly what happened. Um, blood pressure was 80 over 64, which is extremely low. Um, her O2 is 98, pulse 91. Obviously, she's in pain. She's five foot four, 150 pounds. You can read through all of that. Basically, her range of motion was almost full but in every position, she had pain right on her SP at C7. She also had low back pain, so we went through all of that, and that was less severe. Um, we did treat that. Balance was pretty good. Um, obviously, she had some issues there, cranial nerve testing. Um, basically, uh, she had some disruption. Direct stimulation um, was a little tough, poor antipsychotics. Um, going through all of this, um, orthopedic testing, basically everything pointed to what is happening. Um, she didn't have any upper motor neuron lesions though, so I felt confident in 
treating her, sending her in for some imaging of her neck, her cervical spine, just to make sure that there was no fractures or breaks. Um, we didn't do anything P to A except put too much stress, stress on her neck, but we did adjust um, we did adjust ribs and upper thoracic spine. Did some massage on her neck just for some pain relief. Um, found some per peripheral neuropathy, right? Typical chiropractic case, motor vehicle accident coming in, neck and low back pain, right? Something you would conclude from any slamming on the brake, standing on the brake, getting rear-ended, looking up with the airbag, right? Um, so you expect it's going to be a certain amount of recovery, um, treatment, 12 weeks. A lot of people do more adjustments than that. Um, I chose to do less because the patient had Crohn's disease and other things that metabolically would, it would maybe be a deficit in my opinion to treat her more than that. Okay, so we get into finding the hernia. This is where I get excited. Okay, so patient comes in for motor vehicle accident. You saw everything. Typical case, gonna be done in three weeks. Her shoulder just not would not get better. So, oh, she didn't have a fracture in her neck. She didn't have any issues with that. Um, so we treated, everything's getting better, but her left shoulder, it just, it hung on, right? So there was, there was more stuff going on and we're getting to the end of the care. And I mean, normally it's gonna go down a little, right? But it didn't change. So I dug in a little bit more. I found that her family history showed um, cancer, right? So pancreatic cancer, I believe it was um, in her family. And so I'm like, you know, let's just, let's just image it. Um, so I referred her out, got some imaging, um, and it came back that she had a hiatal hernia. And that's what the first slide of this whole thing was talking about. So the MD found that she had a hiatal hernia and her recommendation was, let's get you into surgery right now. Let's do it. Why wait? You're in pain. You can be in and out and then you're six weeks off of work and you have work comp and it'll be great. And she literally stopped her MD and said, I'm going to call my chiropractor. And she's in the office of her MD calling me. Um, so this is where it was really cool to see in her CT scan that a hiatal hernia, hernia came up and she had no tumor. She had no other issues, no actual physical issue of her shoulder. It literally was a hiatal hernia causing substantial pain in her left shoulder. Um, so when I treated it, it was just the typical palpate, breathe, pull. Um, this is the technique that we learn in school. You practice um, on patients while you're learning and then you get out into real world and go, wow, I have a case study. This one came in and we didn't even know what was happening and now we have imaging of it. We gotta image it again to make sure that it's gone, right? So after adjusting, um, I sent that same thing um, at home, exercises home where you look stupid and you stand and you drink water and do all that stuff. Um, and I saw her on her normal routine schedule, I think it was twice a week for two weeks. We just palpated, did some massage around that area. She did her at home stuff and then we sent her back for imaging. And then we got confirmation of resolution. I need to find um, her imaging. I'd like to apply this to there too. We did end up doing an x-ray, a chest x-ray I believe we ordered, um, which it showed complete resolution, right? A CT is a little overkill for that. But that's what I mean about imaging. It's oftentimes you see the hiatal hernia because something else is going on or it's causing some other symptom, it's not usually why you order the imaging. Um, so it was very cool to see this. So when we got her imaging back and her pain was gone and her idle hernia was gone, it was just like, wow, this is why I do what I do. Now you have to remember, this is about six months, eight months into practice for me. So I was getting cases like this all the time where 
you know, this patient comes and they've been seen by every practitioner and I just diagnose them with hemochromatosis. And my old self wasn't confident enough to actually say, okay, you need to go and donate blood. My old self sent them to an MD and they ran tests on them that cost the patient fifty to seventy thousand um, dollars. I don't know how much insurance paid for it, but they put them through the gamut. And all you have to do is <laughs> literally you get um, genetic testing, and then you go and give blood, and you just retake labs every three to six months to twelve months, depending on where you're at in the disease progression. Progression. So that's the thing is we have to remember as practitioners that when we see something sending them off like for newbies you know um, for newly uh, graduated doctors out there we have to remember that our skills um, as another chiropractor our skills are great um, we're trained to do these things and to build that confidence that's why you need to be in a team of people you need to be able to have the chiropractors, the seasoned chiropractors around you that have had much more experience than you. Um, it, it's very cool to be in practice, but at the same time, we have to learn these things and it's easier to learn from other practitioners. So that concludes the hiatal hernia, the hiatal hernia case report. Remember, um, imaging is not required to tell you if you have a hiatal hernia. I hope you don't have to get imaging for it because you're probably in severe amounts of pain um, and most likely those ones end up getting surgery and then type four. So I hope you learned a ton. I hope you enjoyed the little animation in the slideshow and the information. And if so, please subscribe. Please tell all of your friends and family um, I hope to keep releasing content that's applicable for all of us at every time and every place in life. So have a great day and hope to follow up soon.